Okay, so I'm going to open it up and we'll see since it is, we can do these labs so stinking fast. Okay, so it was this one and this one. Oops. I swear figuring out where to put the mouse on this is the hardest part of learning it. Okay. Um, so I have all the three chemicals in there. I'm going to add my condenser and my heating mantle and my nitrogen line and hit start. I think it took me at least two hours in order to just get the ether and the product. Okay. Okay. There we go. So I'm going to just put that over there. Oh, we have to do the separatory funnel first. Let's move the separatory funnel. So it's in with the ether. Um, so you actually aren't separating it from the ether. So we'll do like just a water wash. So we've added the water. So right now where my mouse is at, I'm in the organic layer. And so the chalkboard's telling me it's my product and ether. And then if I just move my mouse down, it's the water layer. So I'm just going to click and drag on this one. And when you do that, it just takes the ether out of it for you. So okay. if I, yeah, if I put my mouse right here on the chalkboard, it's just the product. So if this was real life, <laughs> um, we would do a water wash. And so this water over here is just garbage. I can dump it into my little waste bin over there. Um, and what we would normally have is our product mixed with ether. And then we would heat it up to evaporate off of that ether, but the uh, it just magically happens in in our fake lab. Okay, yeah, that that's all I was confused about. I was like, nothing's making it separate from the ether of all the three bottles that are on the bench. Yeah, and it is it's you know it's it's soluble in the organic layer, so it stays with the ether, but you don't actually have to separate it. So. It does it for you. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, good afternoon. So a couple things before we start. Um, finding my page in my notes over here. We are going to start chapter 18 today. So chapter 18 is the last chapter in, in this section. So our next test is two weeks from today. I'm pulling up my calendar just to double check that I'm not telling you any lies. Uh, but it will cover chapters 16, 17, and 18. So on that note, talking about the test, because, let's see, pulled up my schedule here. My old laptop can't handle doing Zoom and other things. Yeah, it is two weeks from today. So today we're going to start chapter 18. We're going to talk about benzene reactions. On Monday, we're going to talk about, well, now that our benzene has something attached to it, what happens when we want to attach a second thing to it? Um, and so it will be a lot of discussions on electron donating, electron withdrawing groups. And then next Wednesday, we'll finish up the chapter. And the big part of that is if we have a benzene ring with like four, four different substituents, how do we make that? What order do we put those substituents onto the ring? So that one is actually a lot of like multi-step synthesis approaches. So the test will be the week after that. So the Monday of week seven will be a study day, and then the Wednesday will be the exam. Because this is a live online class, we do live lectures. That also means that the exams will be during our lecture time and will be proctored. And I didn't want to use any of the 
proctoring software. Um, so I don't know if any of you had experience with those, but um, there's one called Proctorio and there's one called Respondus, um, but they either lock down your browser so you know you can't do any internet searches or they like literally record you from your webcam and record any movement. So ideally, you know, like if you're taking a test, this should be your movement. So even if they like see you like scratch your head, it like puts up little alarms so that the teacher has to go and review your video. Uh, it just seemed a little intrusive. And from what I've heard from other students, it made the test more stressful than it needed to be. So as a department, yeah, exactly. Um, as a department, we kind of came up with a kind of a low tech version, but you know, still high tech because we're doing things online. So kind of a low tech alternative. Um, so we're going to do it through Zoom. Cameras will be on. Um, your camera needs to show you and your workstation. So instead of having like a camera in front of you, you're gonna have a camera to the side. So I will see you in like a profile view and then your work area. Um, Professor Wada made a couple videos on how to set this up. Um, he made one for either a laptop or a tablet, or no, I'm sorry, he made one for a laptop and then he made one for a tablet slash phone. Um, I do have those posted on Canvas. They're in the first module, the class information module. I can't remember exactly what it's called, but like the beginning module and it's called test proctoring and procedures. And that, so I will, I'll bring it up on Canvas again and I'll post a link to that page just so you can find it easy. But I'm bringing it up now because our test is in two weeks. So it would be a good time to start thinking about your workstation and where you would take your exam and how you would set up your, your laptop tablet, phone, whatever you're going to use, because um, you will probably need something for some height. So boxes or books, noticing that you can see my stack of Amazon boxes behind me. So um, if you're doing as much online shopping as me these days, you probably have a stack of boxes somewhere in the house. Um, but okay, that's it. Uh, just something to think about. I'll, I'll uh, make sure I post on Canvas this week, a link to that and a reminder to start thinking about it. Um, and there was something else I was going to tell you. Let's see, let me bring up the slides. It will come to me, I'm sure. Oh, huh, I remember what it is. I knew as soon as I started moving forward, I would remember um, the exams. So I am in the middle of, <laughs> I am, so Aylin, we talked about this week's lab a little bit and I talked about how we're going to take our next test, but it is all recorded so you can go back and, and listen to those few minutes you missed. Um, so I am in the middle of grading the test number one. It, it takes a while to grade them, as you might imagine, because everybody had a unique test. Um, essentially, I have to make an answer key for each person. So it takes about an hour or so to grade each exam um, and it's sometimes longer, sometimes shorter, just kind of depends. So I'm about halfway through with all of them. I have the scores hidden until I'm done with all of them, just so, you know, half the people don't have theirs and half don't. Um, occasionally Canvas messes with me and will unhide them. So you might get a notification that yours is graded and then when you go to see your score, there won't be anything there. And that's why, because Canvas and I don't always get along. Um, I think that is it for the uh, little updates to talk about. Oh yeah, I like the uh, laptop on your on your waste pa waste paper basket. Um, so Natasha, did your calculus teacher essentially do the same thing that I'm doing? Just you had to position it so you could see your area. Yep, pretty much. Um, and her deal was she didn't even want us to use um, calculators. She oh, was like, <laughs> for calculus? That sounds horrible. <laughs> it was. It was kind of nice. I, because if, if you are given a test that says no calculator, 
that means that everything on that test should be able to be done without a calculator. This is true. Um, when I so when I was graduating with my bachelor's in chemistry, I honestly had no idea what I was going to do with it. I knew how to be a student, so I applied to grad school. It's really the only reason I went to grad school is because all I knew how to do was be a student. Uh, so I signed up to take the GRE, which is essentially like the SAT, but for grad school. And I signed up to take it about a week beforehand. So I didn't really study for it, but I borrowed my friend's prep book and you don't get to use a calculator on the math section but the first thing i read was that the math on the gre is easier than the math on the sat so i stopped studying but then i also realized i had to relearn how to do long long division by hand so that was my my only thing i practiced <laughs> so a little heads up if you plan on taking that gre <laughs> um, going into my masters hold on let me get out my fourth grade math book right? it was crazy yeah it's it's also comforting to be able to put four plus two in a calculator on a test. <laughs> yeah, just hold on. Let me pull out my TI-89 engineering calculator. Just to be sure. Yeah. Have to write like some. Very true. Uh, <laughs> have to write 50 lines of code to do one equation. <laughs> I think the worst part was though, my professor wasn't very tech savvy. She ended mm. up quitting like out of the Zoom twice. <laughs> <laughs> he gave us five extra minutes to get back together. Oh my gosh. If there's no activity in the Zoom, it times you out after 40 minutes. But I don't actually know what counts as activity. Because sometimes, you know, if nobody shows up to my office hours, it will time out. So I try and like maximize and minimize the screen every 20 minutes or so just to make sure there's some kind of activity. Yeah. All right. We're going to start aromatic substitution reactions today. These are the generic reactions we're going to look at. So we know that benzene is super stable. It's pretty unreactive. And so because of that, every reaction we're going to look at has some type of catalyst involved with it. Now the generic reaction category that we're looking at is that these are called EAS reactions. So the E stands for electrophilic, and A is aromatic, and S is substitution. So the aromatic part makes sense. We're using benzene. The electrophilic and the substitution part means that we're going to take our benzene ring, we're going to add an electrophile to it, and we're going to substitute out something else. So essentially, we're going to remove a hydrogen and replace it with an electrophile. The benzene is our nucleophile. And so we know a nucleophile likes a nucleus or likes positive charges. So for something to be a nucleus, that means it needs a negative charge or a partial negative charge or a lone pair. Or in benzene's case, it needs to have a pi bond because that pi bond, those pi electrons are able to react with something else. They're um, it's an easier bond to break than a sigma bond because it's above and below the rest of the molecule. Um, we talked about that second bullet point there. And then the last bullet point says the ring is still aromatic. And this is really the driving force to finish the reaction. The ring goes back to being stable and aromatic. The phrase that we hear a lot in, in these reactions is aromaticity is restored. And so as we go through the steps, the last step is to restore the aromaticity to the reaction. Here is our general mechanism. So, well, let's look at the general reaction here on the top. We have the H on our benzene ring is highlighted. We're reacting it with our electrophile and we're doing, we're doing our substitution. So the electrophile is substituting out the hydrogen. These are the options that we have for electrophiles. For the halogen there, we're gonna use chlorine and bromine. We have a nitro group, a sulfone group. This guy is called an acyl group. So it's a, essentially a ketone. 
Um, when we use the, the suffix YL, so for example, this is an alkyl group, alkyl and acyl, when we're using that YL, we're saying that it's a substituent, it's attached to something else, it's not existing on its own. So we're attaching a ketone substituent to that benzene ring. We have the general mechanism down here on the bottom. So in that first step, we're doing a nucleophilic attack. And all of our reactions are going to involve kind of three, three parts here. Well, technically four parts, but we're not seeing one of them on this slide. So we're going to start with this nucleophilic attack. And we're using the pi electrons from that benzene to attack our electrophile. The second portion is all resonance. So this isn't technically a mechanism step. Resonance is just a movement of electrons, of pi electrons, lone pair electrons, but we're not making or breaking any sigma bonds. So this is just resonance. And when the Y, when that electrophile adds, we now have two things attached to the same carbon. So that carbon goes from sp2 hybridized to now sp3. And as our pi electrons move around the ring, it gives us these three different resonance contributors. And there's one thing specifically I want to point out here. As our carbocation moves through the ring, so we move our pi electrons over, we get a new carbocation. We move our pi electrons over, and we get our last carbocation. Look at which carbons it's on. So if we were kind of, if we were numbering these around the ring, it would be on one, three, and five. It's on every other carbon. It skips its way around the ring. So this is not going to be a big deal today, but on Monday, we're going to talk about this again and how, how adding a second substituent to the ring is going to come into play with that carbocation movement. So we get our three resonance contributors, and I'm going to erase that last circle because it got a little bit in my way there. The last portion, so three portions, nucleophilic attack, resonance, the third thing here is that we're going to do a proton transfer. So happening right here is a proton transfer. And so we know that the terms nucleophilic attack and proton transfer, I think that that was chapter six, if I'm remembering correctly, but we talked about the different mechanism steps. What we're doing there is we're taking off that hydrogen and the little B here, that's just generic for base. We'll talk about which specific bases we're using with each reaction. But we're just using a base there. The base grabs the hydrogen, and then those electrons go towards that carbocation to give us back our ring, and the aromaticity is restored. So a hydride shift is if we moved, let's see, we will see a hydride shift today too, but. If we do, so that's the same molecule. A hydride shift would be if we just took that hydrogen and moved it right there. So it's all happening within the same molecule. We're not removing the hydrogen. And so if we did that, our hydrogen is there our electrophile is there, but now our carbocation has moved over. So a, a one, two hydride shift or a one, two methyl shift keeps the carbocation in the molecule, but it's shifting it to a more stable location. So that's not what's happening here, but good question on a refresher there. So we're just gonna cross this off. Not what's happening, <laughs> but good reminder, good refresher. Uh, so we did our proton transfer, we used our base to take off that last hydrogen, and we have our new product there with a new electrophile attached. There's 
two more things I want to point out here. This last step is labeled as fast, and that first step is labeled as slow. So that first step, the one that's labeled as slow, we could also call this our rate determining step. So I'm going to label it as RDS, rate determining step. So we, um, we haven't talked about that in a while. Um, definitely a hot topic of second semester general chemistry when we do a lot of kinetics and thermo. The rate determining step is really just the slowest step in the reaction and it determines that overall time or speed that a reaction takes. And that first step is the slow step for two reasons. First, when the electrophile reacts with the benzene ring, we lose our aromatic structure. So we're going down in stability a lot. Second, it creates a carbocation. So not only do we lose the stability that we had, but we've now added something that is even less stable. So if we think about this in terms of an energy diagram, this would have a very tall hill. It would have a very big activation energy to overcome the stability that it currently has and create something that's much less stable. And then that last step is very fast for the exact opposite reasons. We are getting rid of that carbocation and we're getting that aromatic structure back. Any questions about our, our generic reactions there? Okay, then let's look at some specific ones. So we're going to start here with the halogenation. And there's one thing I want to point out. So these are labeled as reaction one and two in our textbook. So I'm at the end of chapter 18. It's page 833. There's always this nice, I know you guys probably can't see it that well, but on this page over here, there's a nice reaction summary. And it gives you the starting material reagents products of all the reactions in the chapter, and they're numbered. So I'm using the same numbering sequence that that summary does in the book. Um, I point this out just so that you know where my numbers are coming from. I also point it out because we don't always look at the reactions in number order, which is kind of funny because I'm getting the numbers from the book and I go by the chapter sections that are in the book, but they're just not always numbered in order. So we are starting with reaction one and two. There's not a whole lot of difference between them. The first one is the bromination. The second one is the chlorination. So in both of them, we're reacting our benzene with either Br2 or Cl2 and iron 3 bromide or iron 3 chloride. So we could even make this a little bit more generic. So if you're making a reaction notebook or you're making flashcards, whatever helps you learn these you could kind of sum these up as one reaction that looks like this. And then underneath it, we can just put X equals BR or CL. Professor? Yeah. What's the significance of chlorine in, or uh, iron in these, uh, um, I, I don't know if catalyst is the right word, but we've used iron a couple of times over the arrow and I'm not, I'm just wondering like what's the significance why is it you know bonded to whatever we're trying to attach so perfect question because that's exactly where we're headed next the iron chloride and iron bromide are lewis acid catalysts so going back to our acid base definitions we normally use the bronsted lowry definitions which is kind of hydrogen exchange either hydrogen donor hydrogen acceptor um, a lewis acid catalyst or a Lewis acid is an electron pair acceptor which means that a Lewis base would be an electron pair donor. So this, this is not a, a definition or a um, it's not a way that we describe things very often in general chemistry or organic chemistry. We are 
we definitely focus on the hydrogen ex hydrogen exchange. If you head into inorganic chemistry next, you'll talk a lot more about Lewis acids and bases because one of the common types are metals, specifically transition metals, which is where iron comes into play. So in order for something to be an electron pair acceptor, it has to have space to take on these extra electrons. So this can mean one of two things. It can either mean that it has empty orbitals or it can mean that it has less than an octet. And we're gonna talk about both of those, but iron fits into that first category. So grabbing my periodic table over here. So iron's in the transition metal section. So our electron configuration for iron is 4s2, 3d6, which means that it has a 4p orbital that's empty. All the transition metals are in that same scenario. They all have two s electrons and then some number of d electrons but they have that empty p orbital. So we can use that empty p orbital to accept these extra electrons. So that is why we see a lot of metal-based catalysts. Um, and iron fits into this because it does have those chlorines or bromines attached to it. So it means that there won't be any other, um, anything else that could possibly react with the benzene meaning we wouldn't want to use iron bromide in our chlorine reaction or vice versa because the other halogen could attach. Now the other option for a Lewis acid catalyst is having less than an octet. So down here it also says that we can use aluminum chloride or aluminum bromide for either of these. So underneath these arrows I'm just going to put or ALBr3 or AlCl3. So if you remember with aluminum, and aluminum shares a family with boron. So um, a lot of times we're more familiar with boron doing this, but aluminum does as well. We just don't see aluminum as often because it is a metal. So it doesn't always form covalent bonds. Uh, just kind of depends on those electronegativity differences. Aluminum is stable, neutral, happy with three bonds or six electrons. So it has less than an octet. It has the space available because it hasn't filled up all of those p orbitals. Some of them are filled, but it definitely has space to take on an extra bond or an extra pair of electrons. So iron and aluminum are fulfilling the same job. They have space to take on those extra electrons, which makes them good Lewis acids, and specifically Lewis acid catalysts in this case. Uh, one bullet point that I skipped over right here, it says that when we use iron, a lot of times the iron chloride or iron bromide are actually made in the reaction. So I'm going to show you one more way that this can be written out. We have our benzene. Instead of writing Br2 and FeBr3, we might just see it written as Br2 and just iron. So within our reaction mixture, the iron and the bromine would react together to create the iron bromide, and then they would react with the benzene. Um, it's not going to react out of order because benzene's so stable that the other two, which are more reactive, would react first anyways. And then the last little part on here, fluorine and iodine. And this is a reasoning we use a lot. When we talk about reacting halogens, we often say that bromine and chlorine are going to work, and then we say we ignore fluorine and iodine. Fluorine's too reactive. It reacts too quickly, which actually means that it's a violent reaction or an explosive reaction. And then iodine is just too slow and it doesn't react. So in terms of our column of halogens, 
fluorines at the top and iodines at the bottom. So you can always just think of those as being too extreme and we stick to the middle. We stick to the bromine and the chlorine. Professor? Yeah. Um, on the last lecture, you mentioned that, um, I, I forget what it was. It was maybe, maybe it was hydrogenation or something. And it was like a really, there was like a, a lot of pressure and mm -hmm. high temperatures. What did you mean like uh, that the yield would be really low? Like why, why would it be low? So when we react something at such high pressures and high temperatures, it, we will get some of the product we want, but it can also just cause the other bonds to break because we're giving them so much energy. Uh, so if we're starting with 10 grams and we're, well, 10 grams is not a good example. If we're starting with 10 moles and we're expecting 10 moles, a bunch of that, half of it is going to just break apart. And because it has so much heat, and pressure and energy, it might break all the way down to just methane as it as those bonds are given enough energy to break. Uh, so we wouldn't get a high yield of the product that we care about. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank okay. you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions on our first couple of reactions here? We're going to look at the, the mechanism for them on the next slide. Will you let us know which one, which mechanisms we should know? Yes, I will. Um, I will give you guys a study guide for the test. I kind of have it written. I write it out on like paper first, mostly because drawing the structures takes a lot longer with software compared to on a piece of paper. So I go old school first. Um, I think it's pretty much done. So once I get it actually typed up and make sure it's not too long, then I'll give you guys a, a study guide. Okay, um, cool. What you'll see about this, though, is that these mechanisms are super similar. So it's kind of nice for studying because there's not a whole lot of differences to learn. So here is our first mechanism. Now, on that first slide, when we were looking at the generic mechanism, I said that there was three, three parts to it. There was a nucleophilic attack, there was resonance, and then there was a proton transfer. And I said that there was a fourth part that wasn't shown. This is the fourth part. So it technically happens first. So I guess the other ones were two, three, and four. This is number one. With all of the reactions we're looking at, we have to look at how the electrophile forms. So we're using these Lewis acid catalysts or some type of catalyst in all these reactions. It's going to react with our electrophile source. So in this case, the Br2 or the Cl2 to create a better electrophile. So something that is more positively charged or just more reactive. So in this case, we're going to react our bromine with our iron. So in this little arrow right here, this is a nucleophilic attack. So we're doing a reaction on that bromine and what we've created is a good leaving group and a good nucleophile. So this bond right here is now going to be a weak bond. It's going to be a weak bond because the bromine that's attached to our iron is positively charged. So those electrons are going to be getting pulled towards the positively charged bromine which means that our bromine on the outside is going to be more reactive. So on that first structure, they're labeled as electrophiles and leaving groups. And then in the second structure, they're labeled as better leaving group and better electrophile. So by adding that extra bond in there, we've weakened that bond and made them both better at their job. So here's that second part where we're gonna see nucleophilic attack, resonance, proton transfer. So nucleophilic attack. So we're gonna go from the pi electrons of our benzene ring, that first arrow right there is doing a nucleophilic attack. This bromine right here is my electrophile. And then that, that little tiny arrow right there that is the loss of our leaving group. 
So we just did a nucleophilic attack and loss of a leaving group at the same time. Technically, that's an SN2 reaction. So the benzene ring is our nucleophile, the bromine is our substrate, but we've we don't really see anything new. It's just reusing all those same steps we've talked about. Now we have what's called a sigma complex. It's not an important word. I'm pointing it out though because it does get used in the book. So just so you know what it's referring to, it's this benzene ring with a carbocation in it. But we have these three resonance contributors So showing that carbocation moving around the ring, showing the pi electrons moving around the ring. Again, we're going every other carbon as we move around the ring. And then in that last step, we're gonna do a proton transfer. And so we have two arrows. Our first arrow right here is going from that bond between the bromine and the iron. And so two things are gonna happen there. We're gonna form a bond between the hydrogen and the bromine. So we're gonna make HBr. The second thing that's happening is that bromine iron bond is breaking because we're using those electrons for something else. So we also create FeBr3. Now we know one of the definitions of a catalyst is that it doesn't get used up. So right there, we regenerated our catalyst, which helps show that it is a catalyst. It started as FeBr3 and it ends as FeBr3. The second arrow is going from the electrons that are between the carbon and the hydrogen back into the ring to form that pi bond. And so we end up with our final organic product that we care about right there, our brominated benzene ring with that aromatic structure restored. Questions at all about our mechanism here? All right, reaction number four. So this is where we're going kind of in a weird order. Um, reaction number four is a sulfonation reaction. So we're adding a sulfone group to the ring. Um, so SO3H is called a sulfone group. So the reagent we're using for this is just H2SO4. The H2SO4 is going to have two jobs. It's going to be our electrophile source and it's going to be a catalyst. Um, the fuming part literally means what you think it means. Like if you open a bottle of concentrated strong H2SO4, there's literally H2SO4 fumes that come out of the bottle. It's fuming. That's what it means. So it's concentrated enough that we see those fumes. Here is the first part of our mechanism down here. So this is the generation of the electrophile or the creation of the electrophile. We're reacting two sulfuric acid molecules together. And so this is an acid-base reaction or a proton transfer reaction. So this one is acting as the acid. It's our proton donor. And this one's acting as the base. It's our proton acceptor. So we're doing a proton transfer. And so what we create, this would be the conjugate acid, and this is our conjugate base. The conjugate acid has that extra hydrogen on the oxygen. So really what we just made is a really good leaving group. So what's happening right here is the loss of a leaving group. Uh, we've seen water as a leaving group before, especially when we did our substitution elimination reactions. We learned that alcohols aren't very good leaving groups, but if we add a hydrogen to them, we turn them into water and makes them a much better leaving group. So we did the exact same thing right here. <coughs> Excuse me. 
So water leaves and we create a sulfonium ion. So the sulfonium ion is our electrophile. Um, we often see it in its SO3 form though. So this is how we're going to use it as our electrophile. It's, it's in equilibrium as SO3 or SO3H plus. Um, so they both are going to work as electrophiles. Either one could be shown. So that's our first part. We've created our electrophile. Second part. Second, third, and fourth part. Starting over here, we're doing our nucleophilic attack. So again, we're starting at the pi electrons of our benzene ring, and we are attacking our electrophile. So this is our SO3 that we just made on the last slide. And so notice that there's two arrows. There's one going to the sulfur to make the bond to the sulfur, and then there's this second arrow. So that's just kind of a flow of electrons arrow, but the reason I pointed out is as those electrons go up onto that oxygen, we are creating a negative charge on that oxygen. So then we have our three resonance contributors. We have our carbocation moves around the ring, pi electrons move around the ring, and when we get to that third resonance contributor, here's where we're going to do our proton transfer. So this time we're going to use water as our base. Going to grab onto that hydrogen. The second arrow is going to break the bond between the carbon and the hydrogen to create our benzene ring. So this is the product that we get. But because we put that negative charge up onto that oxygen, we do have one more step. So we're going to do one more proton transfer to add a hydrogen back onto our oxygen and make it neutral again. So we often see this written as SO3H. So we just see it written as its formula. Um, so I think that this right here is good to see because we can see how it's bonded to the ring um, that we have the sulfur double bonded to two oxygens and then single bonded to that OH group. Um, our catalyst in this case was the H2SO4, but we know that H2SO4 is a strong acid. So really when it's in, and that's honestly, that's not even an equilibrium. When it's in water, because it's a strong acid, that first hydrogen gets removed very easily. So saying that we have H2SO4 is essentially the same thing as saying that we have hydronium because it is a strong acid. And so we're using water as a base in this and bringing back that hydronium. So that's how we are restoring our catalyst in this reaction. Any questions about our sulfonation reaction? Okay. This is a reversible reaction. Uh, this one doesn't get its own number but adding concentrated sulfuric acid will add the sulfone group and then reacting that with a dilute sulfuric acid will remove that sulfone group. So this is something that will definitely come into play in the second and third parts of this chapter because we can use that to block certain carbons. So meaning if we want to add something to the ring and we know it will be more likely to go to carbon two versus carbon four, we can add this on first and force something to go to a different position and then just remove this group later on. So it's a good little bouncer. All right, reaction number three. 
So reaction number three is our nitration reaction. So a, ni a nitro group is an NO2 group. So to do this reaction, we are reacting our benzene with nitric acid, which is our electrophile source, and sulfuric acid, which is our catalyst. So the first part of our mechanism is down here on the bottom, creating our electrophile. So we're reacting our nitric acid with our sulfuric acid. And again, we're doing an acid-base reaction or a proton transfer. Our nitric acid is grabbing the hydrogen from the sulfuric acid. So that means that my sulfuric acid is my acid and my nitric acid is acting as my base. Uh, it happens in this order or in this, um, this direction because sulfuric acid is a stronger acid than nitric acid. So we would have to have something that is stronger than nitric acid to act as our catalyst for this. And so what we make, I'm going to draw one more thing in here that's not included, but we would make HSO4 minus, that would be the conjugate base of our sulfuric acid. And we make H2NO3 plus, which is the conjugate acid of our nitric acid. But really, we just added a hydrogen onto that oxygen. So our mechanism that's happening in this step is the loss of a leaving group. So this arrow right here is the loss of a leaving group. The second arrow on this side over here is just of the flow of electrons domino effect type of arrow. We have a negatively charged oxygen, a positively charged nitrogen, so that's just a flow of electrons attraction. We're losing water. So on the arrow right here, it's showing minus H2O. That's really just another way to say that water was our leaving group or that water broke off from the reaction. Um, it's really, in, it's putting it over there instead of putting plus H2O, it means the same thing. It's just kind of a way to switch back and forth. But what we've just created is NO2 plus, which is called a nitronium ion, and it is our electrophile. So with all of these reactions so far, we've done bromination, chlorination, sulfonation, now nitration. After that first step, the goal is to make something that is either positively charged or partially positive, partially positively charged so that it will react quickly with that benzene ring. So here's that same mechanism we've seen. First part, nucleophilic attack. So we're going from the pi bond of our benzene ring. We're bonding to our electrophile there. And we are creating that carbocation. We end up with our three resonance contributors. And then in that last step, we're doing a proton transfer. So again, we're using water as a base, but just like with the last one, sulfuric acid was our catalyst. So we're, we're regenerating hydronium, H3O+, which is essentially what happens to a strong acid in water. And then we make our final product here. 
Um, this one is not drawn out like the other one, so I do want to add one more structure here. Because it can be a little bit confusing with our nitro group. So if we look at our electrophile when it is bonding, we have a double bonded oxygen. And then the other oxygen over here in that first step, our double bond is becoming a single bond. So this is actually what a nitro group looks like when we draw it out. There is a charge on the nitrogen, there is a charge on the oxygen. There's resonance within that nitro group though because I could have drawn the double bond to the oxygen on the bottom one, which means the top one would have that negative charge. We're not going to have two double bonds going to the nitrogen that might look like we would cancel out all the charges, but that would also give nitrogen 10 electrons around it, and nitrogen is too small to have an expanded octet. So this is what the structure of it looks like, um, but we do normally see it written as just NO2. So it's good to know what it does look like. I'm looking at my, my notes here, see if there's anything else. Questions at all about our nitration? Yes. Um, if you were to, um, you know, remove more hydrogens, would the mechanism just be this same thing over and over with just another addition of a nitro group? Oh, you mean like add a second and a third nitro group? Yeah. A kind of. And so that's actually like what we're going to talk about pretty much all day on Monday. Um, adding a second group to the ring. So it depends on what group is already on the ring. And if that's going to help stabilize that carbocation or if it would make that carbocation worse. But essentially the mechanism itself is going to be exactly the same. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Um, because of resonance, would both of the oxygens have a partial negative charge? Yeah, yeah. So if we were to draw this as a resonance hybrid, let me do a little editing up here. we could draw it just with our dashed lines going and then we would have partial negative, partial negative. Our nitrogen would still be a full positive though. He doesn't have anybody to share that charge with. Yeah, exactly. Anything else? Okay. We can also do a reaction with that nitro group. So this is reaction number seven. This is called a nitro reduction. Uh, we are reacting our nitro group with iron or zinc in an acidic environment. And then in that second step, uh, basic, so NaOH, and it turns our NO2 into an amine or into NH2. Um, so it is a reduction because we're focused on what's happening to that nitrogen. So we're losing those oxygens. So it is reducing. Um, you don't need to know the mechanism for this one. And then also I realized I didn't say, I'm gonna go back a couple slides here. For this, this bottom one down here, no mechanism for this one either. You don't need to know how to do that in reverse. So if we were to write this one out, just starting with a benzene ring, so we can't just add an amine group to a benzene ring with one step, but we could write it out, whoops, we could write it out as HNO3, H2SO4, so that adds the nitro group, and then we could do, um, zinc and HCl or iron, either one, and then NaOH. And that would give us our aniline, our benzene with the amine group attached. 
So we could kind of mush together reactions three and seven into one combo to create that nitrogen, that amine on our benzene ring. All right, next. The next reaction is called a Friedel Crafts alkylation. And normally we just call it alkylation. Friedel and Crafts were the, the scientists that figured it out. But this is reaction number five. Alkylation, so that means we're adding an alkyl group. So we are using an alkyl halide. So we are showing it here as a secondary alkyl halide. Um, we will talk about some of the limitations on what we can and can't use in a couple slides. So for now, we're just going to say alkyl halide. Um, I do want to mention though, so I did say that this was secondary. With most functional groups, when we use the terms primary, secondary, and tertiary, it refers to the carbon attached to the functional group. So if we have something like this, we're talking about that carbon right there and how many other carbons it's bonded to. So that one's primary. And you guys might completely remember this and think I'm silly for going over this again, but it is one of those things that we haven't talked about in a while. So it's good to have a, a little refresher. And this one will be tertiary because we're looking at the fact that it is attached to three other carbons. Um, there are exceptions to that definition. Nitrogen, for example, when we refer to an amine as either being primary, secondary, or tertiary, we're talking about how many carbons are actually bonded to the nitrogen. But for the most part, we're looking at how many carbons are attached to the carbon that's attached to the functional group. So kind of a little side trip there, but something we haven't talked about in a while. All right, and then the last thing for this one underneath that arrow there is aluminum chloride. And so again, that is our Lewis acid catalyst. So we have the first part of our mechanism on this slide. We're looking at the creation of our electrophile and it looks a lot like what we've already seen. We're starting with a nucleophilic attack. So our aluminum here is our electrophile. Our chlorine is our nucleophile. And again, we can do that because aluminum has less than an octet, so it has the space available. When that happens, we've created a really good leaving group. So the arrow there is the loss of a leaving group. And as a result, we make a carbocation and we make Al Cl4 minus, so that guy's going to come, come back again, but we make a carbocation, which is our electrophile. So really this was just a fancy way to get rid of that halogen so that we can make a carbocation. So we did use chlorines in this case. We had a chlorine attached to our chain and aluminum chloride. It could have been bromines as well, so we could have had a bromine on the chain and aluminum bromide as our catalyst. Here's what we're going to do with that electrophile. Same three parts. So we're starting with a nucleophilic attack using the pi electrons on our benzene ring attacking our carbocation electrophile. Then we go through our resonance. So we have our three different resonance structures there. Pi bonds moving around, carbocations moving around. So same thing we've seen. And then in that last step, proton transfer. So what we're using as a base is the Al Cl4 minus. And so we saw this with our bromination chlorination reaction. Essentially the same thing is happening. We are 
doing a proton transfer. So we're using those electrons to grab that hydrogen. That makes the HCl. It also breaks the aluminum chloride off, which is recreating that catalyst. And we're going to use those electrons to reform that aromatic ring and to get our benzene structure back. And so now we have our alkylated benzene ring. Questions at all on that mechanism? Grabbing more water and trying not to run over a cat. Okay. So oh, there are, oh, go ahead, sorry. Um, so if the ALCL4 is the base, then would the three resonance structures be the acid in this? Yeah, so the, um, the Lewis, Lewis acid, Lewis base definition is that they are electron pair acceptors or electron pair donors. So because the electrons are coming from our aluminum chloride complex, they are the electron donors and the hydrogen that they're bonding to is accepting those electrons. So they are the electron pair acceptor. So yeah, they've, it is an acid base reaction. Anytime we do a proton transfer, we could classify it as a acid base reaction. We could label one thing as the acid and one as the base. We don't always do that in organic chemistry because it just doesn't quite fit a lot of the other language, but it technically fits the definition. All right, a little bit more on alkylation before we move on. We know that not all carbocations are created equal. The more substituents they have, the more stable they are. So methyls are the worst, then primary, secondary, tertiary, and then we get into fancy ones like allylic, and then benzylic. We can use primary alkyl halides in this reaction though, but it will create multiple products. So for example, the, the reaction that's on the bottom there is using a butyl group with a chlorine attached. So when we react, our benzene with butyl chloride <clears throat> and aluminum chloride. We're going to make two products. We're going to get the one we would probably want, meaning it's going to attach at that first carbon at that primary carbon location. But we're also going to get a second product due to rearrangement. So uh, Nilla asked earlier what the difference between a proton transfer and a hydride shift was. So this is where we get into those hydride shifts. They are occurring to make a carbocation more stable. So in this case, and we'll see the mechanism on the bottom here, but our carbocation is going to shift to that second carbon. And so the other product we would get would be that same four carbon chain, but our ring is going to be attached to the second carbon or the secondary carbocation instead of that first one. So here's how both of those can occur. This first mechanism is showing the product without rearrangement. So we have our primary alkyl halide. It's reacting with our Lewis acid catalyst. So we're doing our, our nucleophilic attack. And then we've created our electrophile. So this entire thing becomes our electrophile. 
what we saw in our last mechanism is that the ALCL4 would break off as a leaving group and create a carbocation. What happens in this case, though, is that our benzene is going to react. Oh, let's see, it's highlighted in green. Green's not going to work. Our benzene is going to react right here, and our ALCL4 is going to break away. So we're going to do our nucleophilic attack from the benzene ring and the loss of our leaving group at the same time. So when we saw that before, it was two separate individual steps. This time it's going to happen all at once. And that will give us our product without any rearrangement. What we see in the bottom reaction then, so down here, this is going to be our product with that rearrangement or that hydride shift. So the first step's the same. Again, we're starting with our primary alkyl halide. We're doing a nucleophilic attack on our Lewis acid catalyst. That arrow right there is the loss of a leaving group. So that's what we saw in our last, last mechanism we looked at. And so that would create a carbocation. But because the primary carbocation is not stable, we have a second arrow. That second arrow is a 1-2 hydride shift. And so what that is doing is that it's automatically moving that hydrogen over to the next door neighbor carbon so that we end up with a secondary carbocation and we don't actually see a primary carbocation in this reaction. And so this would give us that second product, the one with the rearrangement. So here's all of it together. This is the same thing I drew on the top of the last slide. And I'm going to put one more thing down here, just kind of as a reminder. So thinking about our, our hydride shift, just because we haven't seen that reaction in a, in a while. Um, if we think about it stepwise, so this does happen at one time. This is a one step reaction but I'm going to show it to you kind of pieced out so that we can see what's occurring. We're going to have that loss of our leaving group. Oh, I need one more chlorine in there. Loss of our leaving group. And then the hydrogen is scooting over. So this is leaving group. This is our hydride shift. And I'm going to draw that, that hydrogen in that we just moved over just so we can see where he went. But we get that secondary carbocation instead. So this product is without any rearrangements or shifts. And this one is with a rearrangement or with that shift. Um, this is going to give us a mix of products. So on paper, that's not a big deal. In real life, in a lab, it's annoying because that means you now have to figure out how to separate them. So we don't want to do this reaction in real life. If we want to create a primary chain on a benzene ring, there's another way to do it, a more efficient way. And so we'll actually see that in a couple slides, but just keep in mind that this is not really the way to, to add that primary chain without a lot of other issues. Questions about the rearrangement at all? Is there a way to um 
prioritize the rearrangement if that is indeed what you wanted to where you only get the rearranged one? If we only wanted the rearranged one, then I would say we should react this with the secondary alkyl halide and then it will only give us that product. So instead of depending on that rearrangement, we could just start with the alkyl group that we intend to add um, because there's not a way to prioritize it. The rearrangement would be the major product because it is the more stable one, but we're still going to get some of the other one and we can't really, we can't really control what the ratio is between them. Gotcha. Any other questions on that? Okay, so one more thing about alkylation. I mentioned the whole primary, secondary, tertiary thing. So these, the, the limitations on here, the stipulations are looking at what, what are some of the rules, I guess would be a way to phrase it. Um, so the first one says that the carbon where the halogen is attached has to be sp3. So that list that I made, primary, secondary, tertiary, allylic, benzylic, they're all game, they all work. What we can't use is we can't have a vanillic halide, so a, a halogen that's directly attached to an alkene carbon, and we can't have an aryl halogen, so a halogen that's directly attached to a benzene ring. In both of these cases, we're using sp2 carbons. And so we also saw this with our substitution reactions, SN1, SN2. We couldn't use these types of, of substrates in those reactions either. Um, the second bullet point tells us that polyalkylation happens often. So on Monday, we're going to categorize sub substituents as either being activators or deactivators and alkyl groups are activators. And so that means once one is on the ring, it's actually easier to add a second one. Um, so this can be something that can be a bad thing because if we don't want to add a second one, um, it could happen without really trying that hard. So this is something that can be controlled though. We can definitely control how much alkyl halide is in our reaction mixture or even the speed that it's added in. So it can, instead of just dumping the two things together and stirring, we can add it in dropwise and let it slowly react so that we are hopefully creating just the monoalkylated product. And then the last bullet point tells us that when there's some substituents on the ring, for example, an NO2 group, we can't do a friedel crafts alkylation. Um, NO2 falls into a group called deactivators. And we'll learn about more of those on Monday. But when we have one of these groups on the ring, it makes it less reactive. And so we can't add that alkyl group. So just some little rules that we got to keep in mind with it. All right. Last reaction, there's kind of a little side one that goes along with this, but last reaction we're going to look at is another friedel crafts reaction, but this time it's an acylation. So we're adding an acyl group or a ketone group to the ring. So this is reaction number six, acylation. We are reacting it with this guy. Uh, the name of this functional group is called an acyl chloride. So more generically, we could call it an acyl halide. Um, it's a ketone, but on one of the sides, there's a halogen group. There are a lot of functional groups that have that carbonyl in the middle, that carbon oxygen double bond. And then whatever we put on the sides will determine what family it falls into. Um, our next group of chapters, so test number three, will cover a whole bunch of um, carbonyl-based reactions. So we'll talk about all of those later on. 
and then underneath there, aluminum chloride, Lewis acid catalyst. So we've seen this guy show up in a handful of reactions now. And then what we're going to create is a ketone attached to the ring. So we could call this a benzylic ketone. That benzylic carbon is the one bonded to the ring. So that means we have a ketone on that benzyl carbon or that benzylic carbon. No polyacylation. So this acyl group, this ketone group, um, will once it's added to the ring, it prevents a second ketone from adding to the ring. And again, that gets into our Monday discussion. So here's the first part of our mechanism. We're going to create a good, oh, this says nucleophile. Let's just cross that right off. That's funny because I would imagine I did a lot of copy and pasting to make these slides originally. Electrophile. We're going to make a good electrophile. So we're starting with a nucleophilic attack. Nucleophile. Electrophile. So we've seen this with our aluminum chloride on a few different slides now. And then in our second step here, we're doing the loss of a leaving group. So our ALCL4 is a good leaving group. And what we've created is called an acillium ion. So an acillium ion is a carbon double bonded to an oxygen and then bonded to something else. So acillium is a very general term. It's not telling us what else is attached to that carbon, which is why we just have it as an R group here. There's also another way to write out an acillium ion. So instead of writing it this way, I can also take, oh, I put my, I jumped the gun there with my positive charge. There we go. I can take my lone pair electrons on my oxygen and do this. So I'm going to do my equilibrium arrows because the two structures are in equilibrium with each other, but what we create is a triple bond to that oxygen and now my positive charge is on my oxygen. Um, so both of these are acillium ions. They both could be used as our electrophile. I think the book uses the triple charged one. Yeah, the book uses the triple charged one, but if this was a test question, you could use either one. It would, they would both work. They'd both make sense. Uh, the reason why the book uses the triple bond one though, is in the triple bonded one, all of the atoms have a complete octet. In the one with the double bond, the carbon does not have a complete octet. So when we're looking at stability of resonance contributors, a complete octet is the highest priority. All right. First step, nucleophilic attack. So again, we're going from the pi electrons of our benzene ring. We are attacking our electrophile. So notice we're going right onto that carbon and then those electrons are moving back onto the oxygen. If we started with that double bonded, oh, that was an ugly benzene ring. If we start with this one, we would actually just need the one arrow is right onto that carbon. Um, so just to kind of point out the differences there. All right, next, resonance. So our three resonance contributors, that pi bond moves around the ring, the positive charge moves around the ring, and then we end it with our proton transfer. So we are using AlCl4 as our base. And again, a couple things are happening after that reaction. We make HCl, 
and we make ALCL3. So the ALCL3 is just our regenerated catalyst. So that's the part that we care about. We are taking off that hydrogen and then the bond between that carbon and hydrogen goes to give us back our benzene ring. Oh, let's try that again. There we go. Uh, we get our benzene ring back with our ketone attached to it. Um, questions about our mechanism here? Okay, last, last slide, last slide and last reaction is reaction number 10. So this is called a Clemenson reduction. Uh, so it's technically this, this part of the reaction. You do not need to know the mechanism for this one. When we have that acyl group attached to our, our benzene ring, we can react it with a zinc mercury complex with acid and heat, and it will completely remove that oxygen. So when we are trying to add our primary chain onto our ring and we get the mixture of products, this is the other way to do it. So instead of adding a primary alkyl group, we can add this ketone group and then just reduce down that ketone and we will only get the one product. So instead of getting that mixture of alkyl groups, we can get just this one nice product um, after these two reactions. And it tells us up here that they're this, so this is essentially saying the same thing that I just did, but we're getting that primary group without rearrangement and without a mixture of products. Questions on, on this last reaction here? I, I see that technically though, we do get a mixture. What is the other 27% um, of product? So that doesn't, that means like a 73% yield. So it's not necessarily that we're getting a second product. More likely it means that the 27% stayed in starting material form. Gotcha. Could you go back to the slide previous? This one? Yeah, I just, I missed the, um, I guess this like summary uh, on top of the, of the um, benzene ring that's doing a this guy up here? Yeah. So this was just if we um, if we draw our psyllium ion with the double bond instead of the triple bond, that's what the first step would look like. So the only difference is when there's the triple bond, we need to have this second arrow right here to turn that triple bond back into the double bond. But if we start with the double bond, we only need the one arrow. So the only difference is the difference in which is psyllium ion we're showing. Okay, cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else? This is, I mean, I may be jumping the gun, but I just kind of want to clarify, like you said that there couldn't be another ketone added to like a, the benzene, but mm -hmm. Um, for something like acetyl salicylic acid, um, it's not the same because that other ketone is attached to an oxygen, right? Yeah, and it doesn't mean that we couldn't add something else and then turn it into a ketone. Oh. It just means, yeah, it just means we can't add the ketone directly. And so, it, yeah, that's, that's okay. where we're headed on Monday. We're going to talk about the activators and deactivators and some of them will make the benzene more reactive and some of them will make it less reactive and it's going to control what we can add and where the second substituent will add. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Anything else for me today? All right, that is it for today then. So 
scheduled for lab today is the chapter 17 worksheet and due today is the chapter 16 worksheet and um, I was told of a couple little errors that were on the chapter 16 worksheet answer key so I did fix those this morning and repost it um, they were very tiny so you might not even have noticed um, but that has been reposted so I think that is it I'll hang out here for a few minutes see if anyone has questions about this or lab or Monday's lecture but that's it so have a good weekend I'll see you Monday thank you thank you thank you guys Bye.